Bokar Tov, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to open uh, the keynote of, the, of this conference by uh, a prominent professor, historian, colleague and friend, Derek um, Penzler. Derek Penzler is a Stanley Lewis Professor of Visual Studies at Oxford and Samuel Zach Professor of Jewish History at the University of Toronto. He is a comparative historian with interest in the relationships between modern Israel and diaspora Jewish societies, global nationalist movement, European colonialism, and post-colonial states. A native of California, Bezler taught at Indiana University in Bloomington and the University of Toronto before coming into Oxford in 2012. Between 2002 and 2008, he directed the University of Toronto's Center of, uh, for Jewish Studies. He and Anita Shapira edited the Journal of Israeli History, and Penzler serves on the editorial board of Israel Studies and Israel Studies uh, Review. Penzler is a fellow of the Royal, uh, Academies, uh, Royal Society of Canada and the American Academy, Ac Academy for Jewish Research. He is the author of editor of 10 books, most recently, uh, Jude and Military a History, published by Princeton University Press in 2013. Professor um, Penzel will lecture on the World War II and the Jewish War. Dirk, um, please. I hope we will have a um, few minutes for questions again. Thank you very much, Mo. Thank you all for coming to this conference. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, there we go. I'll have to do this. The, um, I think the need for this conference was, uh, it was headlined a bit last night in the opening remarks, but I also want to bring to everyone's attention, well, I think most, most of you heard the remarks of the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, a couple of days ago at the reinterment ceremony for the ashes of, uh, of John Henry Patterson at Moshev Avi Chayel, in which he said that the Jew uh, lost the ability to fight the moment that uh, he left Eretz Israel, and that only with the return to Eretz Israel in the 20th century did Jews once again learn the ways of war. And he basically sounded like an anti-Semitic caricature um, of uh, Jews as a people of shirkers and cowards and so forth. And uh, this, um, this is simply a distortion of a historical reality that I think all of you around this table, uh, you're all very well of, uh, aware of, of, of the reality. And the question is how to try to correct, um, to correct the myth. It's something I tried to do in a recent book, even though, um, just to get an example of how difficult it is to address these stereotypes, one of the most commonly uh, visible and available reviews of my book on the internet is from a neo-Nazi website called uh, DestroyZionism.com, and it was quickly picked up by um, OccidentalObserver.com, WhitePower.com, and other websites of the sort that you are unlikely to direct your students to. And the book says, you know, Pensler makes some interesting observations, but he ignores massive Jewish draft dodging throughout history. Of course, I provide all these statistics and show they're not dodging the draft or whatever. And, but at the end of this review, and this is actually what I would like in my, in my um, about an annual evaluation uh, at the University of Oxford, the, one of the neo-Nazis writes, this book is as good as can be expected given the fact that the author is a Jew. And I, felt, I felt very proud of that. Um, so on a more serious note, and a more academically respectable note, what I want to do this morning is just briefly lay out how I believe World War II represents both a zenith and a rupture in the historic relationship between Jews and armed force. That is, um, it's, it's a story that goes back to the late 18th century, the first conscription of Jews in 1788 in the Habsburg Empire, the Levee en masse during the French Revolutionary Wars and so forth. And it's a story that accelerates through the 19th century, reaches a new level in the First World War and, as I'm going to explain, reaches a pinnacle of state uh, demands upon the Jews, but also upon a willingness of Jews to serve the state. So in some ways, World War II represents a kind of the highest point on a curve. On another level, though, World War II represents a, a rupture, in that historically there were tremendous tensions between Jews and the state in the area of conscription, fears about going into the army, 
course, there were many situations where Jews did dodge the draft, but the fact is, in most cultures in many parts of the world, lots of people dodge the draft. Uh, the, the lack of engagement with the state, lack of patriotism, I think that a lot of these concerns faded considerably in the Second World War. And last but not least, the Second World War was the first war in modern history where substantial numbers of Jews were in the field and did not face the threat or the, the, the specter of fratricide, the notion of Jews facing other Jews. Much more historically a myth than a reality, but a very powerful myth. And although there were, of course, some Jews who wind up technically on the Nazi side in World War II, the fact is that in the minds of Jews in World War II, uh, this was a, a war against a single enemy, the Japanese enemy being conflated with the German enemy, and the German enemy being conflated with Hitler, who is Amalek, as well as the American enemy as well. So this theme then of um, a zenith, but also a rupture with the past. And also, as I'll argue at the very end, World War II represents the last great Jewish war. I think since World War II, the concept of, of war for Jewish civilization on the planet has changed considerably. And I'll end with that, but let me give the talk before I can end it. So uh, my wife tells me I need to sign posts more carefully when I give talks. She's a lawyer. She, so she reads my things and says, well, I don't understand how you're getting from one point to the next. <laughs> so I'm going to start with just a very general overview. Again, this is an expert audience, and so I might be speaking to people who know all this material. I had no idea if this was going to be a large public event with, what do you call them, Gilman? Gilmanistim or? Gilmanim. Gilmanim. I didn't know it, uh, so I'll be very brief. As we heard last night, some one and a half million Jews fought in the Allied forces during the war, with perhaps a third in the Red Army, perhaps more than a third in the United States Armed Forces, and the rest largely from Europe, including some 100,000 Polish Jews who took part in the futile defense of their country against the Nazi Blitzkrieg. And many of those Jews went on to serve in the various Polish armies in exile under British or Soviet command. And similar patterns characterize Jewish soldiers in other East European successor states. Just to give one example, there are others. Czech soldiers formed a separate unit within the Red Army, and that was over two-thirds Jewish, and with mostly Jews in positions of, of command. Now we're going to have a panel on Jews as resistance fighters and partisans, and this is actually an interesting methodological question. Clearly, we can't have a conference about Jewish fighters in World War II without talking about ghetto rebels, partisans, resistance, and so on. But this is a conference called Chayalim Yudim. These are not Chayalim. They're not soldiers. And it's something I try to distinguish in the book between, there's, I talk about five ideal types of the modern Jewish fighter, one of whom is the conscripted soldier. But the ghetto rebel or the partisan or the resistance fighter is really something different. Now, that said, obviously Jews play a major role in the resistance movements, in the partisan movements during the war. In France, in particular, particularly active in combat, front tireur, liberation, all of them uh, that formed the, um, the Mouvement Uni de la Résistance, commanded by a Jew uh, in southeastern France, Marc Bloch. Um, as an interesting little sidelight, one of the leaders of combat, who was himself too old to actually take part in military operations, was an elderly gentleman named Fernand Bernard, who was the brother of the famous Jewish writer Bernard Lazar. And Fernand Bernard had been a naval officer, well, not a naval officer, he was in the Marine Colonial in Indochina in the early 20th century, and then, then made millions as the president of the Bank of Indochina in the interwar period, and then wound up back in his native Nîmes. Uh, where he was a resistance leader and died at the age of 97 uh, in the 1960s. But I think that kind of direct connection between a Jewish soldier and Jewish resistance is not always, always present. To talk a bit more about the armies in which Jews fought, the Red Army clearly had the greatest level of Jewish involvement and sacrifice. We have the Red Army right here. Uh, we have the greatest expert in the Red Army right here. Over one-third of Russian Jewish soldiers perished during the war versus about 1.5% of American Jewish soldiers and Jewish generals and admirals in the Soviet Union outnumbered their American counterparts 10 to 1. But there were also uh, similarities between Jews in the Red Army and in the American Army, and I want to focus now for a minute as I move on from just the sheer numbers of Jews fighting in the war to the kinds of things they did. Because one of the areas of continuity between the modern Jewish experience in the 19th to early 20th century and World War II is that to the extent that Jews rise into positions of command, they usually do so in the more technical core. 
and they usually do so in those aspects of the military that are more that are newer and less um, bound to privilege. So it's interesting that, for example, in the United States, Jews are often heavily involved in the Navy, whose development in the 20th century was quite recent, as opposed to, say, the Royal Navy, which was historically um, quite uh, hostile to Jews in the United Kingdom. But just to start with, um, with the Red Army, in the Red Army, Jews were concentrated, those who were in the higher ranks, disproportionately in branches of service that required education and technical expertise. In the 1930s, the Major General G. Ierson had developed new theories of mobile warfare. Other Jewish officers were prominent as inventors and developers of tanks and other armored vehicles. During the Spanish Civil War, 12 of the 30 Red Army armor specialists sent to Spain had been Jews. In 1939, the Spanish war hero, Yakov Shmushkevich, was appointed commander of the Red Army's Air Force, only to be liquidated by Stalin two years later. Three of the Red Army's 20 most, high, most highly decorated submarine commanders during the war were Jews. Now, it was only during the war that the U.S. moved significantly towards religious neutrality, and it was only during World War II that large numbers of Jewish officers began to get taken on. Anti-Semitism did run broadly and profoundly through the officer corps, and yet there was room for Jewish officers, uh, certainly above and beyond um, their numbers in the population, in the most um, senior levels of the technical corps, such as engineering, artillery, supply, and logistics. Commodore Harry Asher Batt, who began his career as an instructor in electrical engineering and physics at Annapolis, then commanded warships in World War II. Admiral Ben Muriel, a civil engineer, founded and commanded the Seabees, a unit of almost a quarter million men that built bases, airfields, barracks, roads, and floating docks for the Navy. The most famous example of an American Jewish military technocrat would have been Admiral Hyman Rickover. He studied electrical engineering at Annapolis and Columbia University, worked at the Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and then developed the Navy's first nuclear-powered submarine. Almost half of the Jewish generals in the U.S. during World War II were in the Navy, which I just mentioned was relatively new in its formation in the United States. Jews were heavily overrepresented in the American Army Air Corps, admission to which required higher education. At its peak, the Air Corps had about 2.5 million men out of about 16 or 17 million Americans in uniform. That was about 15%. But about 30% of Jews who were in the Army were in the Army Air Corps. So they were overrepresented by a factor of about two to one, and it was even more overrepresented in the Air Force. Uh, in Canada in 1943, there were actually almost as many Jews in the Air Corps as in the Army. Now, it's not my purpose here today to run through numbers and statistics for the next you know, half an hour or so. But what I do want to do is focus on an issue that is, I think, surprisingly missing from this conference, and that is the United States. It's odd to have a conference on Jewish soldiers in World War II and not to have a research paper on what was arguably the most sophisticated, wealthiest, and depending on how one counts the numbers, between the Red Army and the United States, still one of the largest uh, contributors of Jews to the war effort. So I'll try today. Uh, I know we're going to have a, a paper on Canada as my newly adopted country. I'm very happy for that. Um, and I think we're going to have uh, a veteran of World War II is going to speak. An American veteran is going to speak this afternoon, I heard. Yes. Yes. But, uh, you know, but let me just talk a little bit about this question of how Jews in the United States dealt with the war in the context of American Jewish history and world Jewish history in general, how they reconciled the demands made upon them as Americans with their own sense of themselves as Jews, and the relationship between American Jews as civilians, the home front, and then the experiences of Jews who are actually overseas fighting or who send, spend the year, um, you who spend the war years stateside. Any push for American Jews to fight, to fight as Jews or Americans alike in the war against Hitler, originated from secular rather than religious voices. Historically, the liberal rabbinate had been starkly patriotic in the German, in that uh, uh, German Jewish reform rabbis, for example, in the 19th century had told Jews that their religious obligations ceased in times of war. In the 19th century, in World War I, French, British, Italian, German, Austrian rabbis had extolled the virtue of military service. They had done so in an overtly political act of advocating for Jewish emancipation by demonstrating the Jews' willingness and ability to fight for their land of citizenship. 
It was in this spirit that rabbis throughout the 1800s had narrated a long history of Jewish military service for empires and not for the ancient land of Israel. One of the most interesting things about Zionist Israeli conversation about Jews in the military is that it focuses on ancient Eretz Israel. Whereas if you read the literature produced by rabbis in the 18 and early 1900s, they talk about Jews as servants of empire, great Jewish soldiers in the Roman army, great Jewish soldiers in the Islamic uh, empires, because they're simply extrapolating from the empires of old to their modern civilizations. Liberal rabbis featured prominently among the six authors of the most important reference work uh, on Jews in the army, the fin de siècle, Jewish Encyclopedia. The entry on army is actually the longest entry in the entire encyclopedia, and it was written by rabbis, including Kaufman Kohler, a great uh, reform rabbi. So this is the world in which rabbis have really been intimately patriotic. But what happens in World War II? Things change very much for the American rabbinate. World War I's horrors had darkened the mood of at least some prominent North American liberal rabbis. And during the interwar ye years, many rabbis in the States developed a strong pacifist streak that persisted into the early years of World War II. In 1939, the influential reform rabbi Judah Magnus agonizingly abandoned pacifism in the face of Hitler's threat to Jewish civilization. So it took 1939 to get Judah Magnus away from pacifism. Yet another reform rabbi, Bernard Gross, continued to be a pacifist in order to deflect accusations that the United States was being goaded into a war by Jews, very common anti-Semitic accusation in the States during the early years of the war, that this was a Jewish war in the sense that nobody else really wanted it. In 1940, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, and that was the Reform Rabbinate's umbrella group, debated conscientious objection and declared by a 38 to 30 vote that one could justify a refusal to serve within the spirit of the Jewish tradition. The conservative movement's rabbinical assembly, also in 1940, approved of conscientious objection. As late as June of 1942, the American Reconstructionist rabbinate recognized the right of Jews to refuse to serve. Now, even within the more liberal movements, public pacifists were few, such as the Jewish Peace Fellowship, founded in 1941 by Rabbi Abraham Kronbach which had only about 100 members. Uh, in 1937, Kronbach famously said that the worst thing about Hitler was that he destroyed the Jews' love of peace. One might think of worse things about Hitler, but anyway. Now, I've talked about liberal and conservative Jews. What about orthodoxy? Orthodoxy, historically, and here's another kind of con transformation, whereas historically the reform and liberal rabbinate had been quite uh, patriotic, even jingoistic, and in World War II, at least in the very beginning of the war, before the Americans entered the war, the liberal rabbinate was more hands-off. Historically, with orthodoxy, we get the opposite. Historically, orthodoxy had been very cautious, if not downright opposed, to Jewish participation in armies. Now, they couldn't, orthodox rabbis could not do so openly. So you have the famous case in 1789 of Rabbi Yechezkel Landau of Prague telling 25 Jewish recruits that they must go and serve their, their Kaiser with dignity and, and loyalty and so on. It's a famous speech which he gave in German. It was translated into Hebrew and has been reproduced many times. There's the famous case of the Chofetz Chaim in his booklet of 1874, Sefer Machane Yisrael, which is, sorry, 1881, which is written in the wake of the 1874 Universal Conscription Decree in Russia, basically explaining to Russian Jews who can no longer get out of military service as easily, you're going to have to serve and here's how you can make the military service as bearable as possible. In real life, of course, Orthodox rabbis in Eastern Europe had done a great deal to, to try to find ways for young men to evade the draft uh, through marriage strategies uh, and or through encouraging immigration or lots of other things. Historically, then, Orthodoxy had been in something of a uh, quandary. But even in the 19th and early 20th centuries, in countries where Jews had been emancipated, Orthodoxy was much more cheerfully accommodating of Jews going into battle. For example, during World War I, there was a spirited halachic exchange about whether or not a Kohen could duchen after battle. The notion is the Kohen goes to war and he might kill someone, he's been tainted by, but could he then perform the Kohenite blessing? So, I mean, they just assume that the Kohen goes to war. That's not a question. The question is merely, can he duchen afterwards? 
So another good example is the Orthodox synagogue in Leipzig that changed its name to the Hindenburg Shul out of patriotic attachment to uh, General von Hindenburg. Now, during World War II in the United States, orthodoxy actually was the least hesitant about endorsing some sort of conscientious objection. In fact, orthodoxy did not tolerate conscientious objection. Perhaps it was an expression of traditional obedience to state authority. Perhaps it was a strong sense of attachment to persecuted European Jews. There's a great story of an orthodox Jew from Brooklyn, he wrote a memoir, who receives his um, draft notice. And his, his mother tells him to somehow go into hiding. I, I don't know how he was supposed to do that. He couldn't go to Canada. Canada was at war, too. Uh, but he goes to his rabbi. Uh, and his rabbi pulls off the shelf Sefer Machina Yisrael. And they read Sefer Machina Yisrael together for two, for two days. I don't know why it would take two days to read it. It's not that long. And, uh, and he goes off and he becomes lieutenant in the um, European theater. And he becomes a decorated officer and so on. The fact is that Jews were the least likely of any religious community in the U.S. to register as conscientious objectors. About 250 Jewish men claimed CO status. They were sent to civilian service or to jail. This number pales in comparison with the over 40,000 Christian COs during the war. About 33 per 100,000 Christians versus 6 per 100,000 Jews. Now, Jews lacked the principal pacifist tradition of Protestant sectarian groups like the Quakers or the Brethren. And although in World War I many Jews had invoked radical socialism to justify pacifism, they really weren't pacifists. I mean, this notion, I mean, I know I'm talking to the converted here, but I, I, I often deal with people who believe that Judaism is a pacifist religion or that the Jewish socialists who opposed the American entry into World War I or something were, uh, were pacifists. No, they were socialists who didn't want to fight an imperialist war. But when the um, Germans carved up Western Russia, and when Russia experienced its own revolution, a lot of those socialists turned into quite patriotic uh, warriors because they wanted to defeat Germany and they wanted to defend the uh, struggling infant Soviet Union. So many a so-called pacifist became a fervent supporter of the war, and the same thing happens in World War II. I mean, between 1939 and 1941, American Jewish communists had a bit of leger de man to deal with in terms of the molotov ribbentrop Pact, but come June of 1941, well, you know, they find ways to um, get out of that dilemma. Now, as Deborah Dash Moore has written, military service in the Second World War was a means of Americanization and the intensification of uh, Jewish ethnic identity. So for Jews who do wind up drafted, regardless of whether they were orthodox or liberal or conservative or reform or none of the above, the war had a very powerful experience, not only in terms of what happens to them when they're in the field, but really what happens to them when they're stateside. That Jews who were concentrated in large cities, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Jews wind up in training camps in the American South. They wind up meeting non-Jews. Now, they've met non-Jews before, but they've met ethnic, urban non-Jews. They've never met you know, farm kids from Kansas. And this experience is both frightening and um, it opens up a whole new world to them. So on the one hand, they experience anti-Semitism. And this is something that I've encountered, you know, I've read about in books, and I've also interviewed a number of World War II American uh, Jews, uh, veterans of, of the war. One of them was my stepfather, uh, Alava Sholem, who was, uh, he went on to become a famous composer and, and uh, a pianist. And he'd been in a Glenn Miller band during the war. And uh, he was a young man then, obviously. But um, an anti-Semitic drill sergeant in the kitchen one day poured boiling water on his hands and said, what are you going to do about a Jew boy? And I have heard stories like this from you know, many people of a certain age. Now, most of them no longer with us, who so were veterans of the Second World War. Did he hear? So th there are these stories. Did he hear? Sorry? The hands. What he, he, I think so. He won, he won four Grammys, so I think he, he did pretty well. Okay. What would have happened if he hadn't poured the water? Maybe he would have won you know, an Oscar. He would have beat John Williams that year, but he didn't. He did well. Um, so, yes, there was that aspect of the experience, but there was also, there was also a sense of um, socialization, particularly once Jews moved from stateside to overseas. One reads in memoir literature about the sense of camaraderie and that one 
when, when you're in a battle situation, the, the really patriotism per se, ideology per se, everything kind of fades into the background as opposed to the desperate desire to stay alive and to fight for yourself and for those immediately around you. And that could develop a sense of real connection between Jews and their non-Jewish fellow soldiers. But on a more abstract level, American Jews could take pride in the considerable number of, say, Jewish chaplains who were commissioned as officers. There were 311, a 15-fold increase over World War I, the first time that Jewish chaplains had ever held an officer's rank. This is a far cry, say, from Germany in World War I, where there were 30 volunteer Feldwabiner. Uh, and so American Jewish apologetic literature of the war emphasized this commonality of spirit, which, as I've said, it's not entirely a fiction. Despite the presence of anti-Semitism in the military, there are these moments of camaraderie that do develop between Jewish and non-Jewish soldiers. But certainly the literature of the time talks about the Jewish, the Judeo-Christian ethos, particularly the camaraderie between Jews, Protestants, and Catholics, the most famous example of which is the USAT Dorchester, which sunk in 1943, and among whose casualties were four army chaplains, a rabbi, a Catholic priest, a Methodist minister, and a Presbyterian minister, who gave up their life jackets and their lives to save crew members. But there are also some other examples of this notion of Jews feeling newly integrated into the United States as a result of the war, and feeling a certain comfort as Jews and as Americans united in the war effort. I want to refer to a little book that, see, you actually told me about. You may not remember this, but like 10 years ago or something. See, one never forgets. A teacher, you know, you learn from your master's shoelaces. What is it about tying the shoelaces? You told me about a little book called Jews Fight Too. So I went and found the book. This is a little book published for children in 1945. little red book. It consists of a series of vignettes of Jewish heroism. And one of the stories is called A Tale of Tolerance. It's about three soldiers, one Jew, one Catholic, one Protestant, who fight and die together. Okay, so far we have integration. But what's interesting about the story is it is in no hurry to dispense with older stereotypes of Jews as kind of mild in character or nebishy, to use a Yiddish term. The book begins, yes, Jews fight too. Perhaps they don't fight any better, not more heroically than other people, but at least not less bravely. This is kind of, you know, self-effacing. We have a vignette called the Shlemiel. It's a story about a Shlemiel who volunteers to join a commando squad charged with capturing Field Marshal Rommel, only to be caught and executed, dying as a Shlemiel, but as a heroic Shlemiel. So this is the book. And the preface to this book written by Congressman and former Boston Mayor James Curley, frames the Jewish contribution to the war effort with a, a much broader notion of a contribution that includes philanthropy. He says, great Jewish war heroes like Julius Rosenwald, founder of Sears Roebuck, jurisprudence, Louis Brandeis, or the financial well-being of America in our critical period of the World War by Morgenthau and Baruch. That is, financial contributions were seen as war heroism just as much as fighting with blood and guts. Now, the book also has conventional heroism. There's a chapter on Moshe Dayan and his daring nighttime raid in Vichy, Syria, which cost him his eye. There's a chapter on the death of the Irgun leader, David Raziel, while fighting against the forces of Rashid Ali during the Anglo-Iraqi War of 1941. But the book also has this emphasis on, on financial heroism. You see this as well in the propaganda literature produced before and during the war by the Jewish veterans of American wars, who, for example, would praise soldiers, but also the American Jewish financier Chaim Solomon, who during the Revolutionary War lent money. That was made him a hero, was that he lent money um, to warriors like Baron von Steuben or General Arthur Sinclair, uh, and arguing that Chaim Solomon essentially rose to their ranks by being a possessor of capital, which he lent out, um, uh, according to the myth, um, without interest. I has anybody seen the, the, the monument to Chaim Solomon in downtown Chicago? Uh, it's, it's right there in, in, in the loop, a, a, a monument to um, uh, Robert Morris, 
another Revolutionary War financier, Chaim Solomon and George Washington. They're all together in a monument. Um, remember it's on Wacker. Wacker and what? I, I can see it in front of me. I don't remember the cross street. So here we have then a kind of an American notion of patriotism in which fighting and financial contributions are similar. You do not see this in English propaganda during the war. So for example, um, uh, Cecil Roth and his pay into the Jews in the defense of Britain would never talk about the Rothschilds or their financial contributions. But one does find this same broad sense of a contribution in the Canadian Jewish Congress's comic book series, Jewish War Heroes, which was produced between 1944 and 1945. Of course, the book contains brief biographies of famous Jewish uh, fighters, such as the American <coughs> boxer Barney Ross or the Russian submarine commander <coughs> Israel Fisinovich. But it also talks about scientific discovery, financial contributions, and so forth. The Hebrew University, it claims, is fighting a war of science. But also, the Jewish Brigade is proclaimed uh, that it fights its great war um, on the Western Front. So, now within this American Jewish world, then, of a kind of integration into American society, an assertion of Jewish particularistic pride, a comfort with financial as well as military contributions, comes a particular sub-variety of Zionist discourse. I'm sorry I used the word discourse. I told myself I would never use that word again. I have a literary agent now who's told me never use that word. An American Zionist language of presenting this war as a war against Hitler for the establishment of the Jewish Commonwealth and that there is absolutely no air, no daylight, between any of these goals. Now, even before America entered the war, at the end of 1941, American Zionists were writing in this vein. Abba Hillel Silver, who was the national chair of the United Palestine Appeal, wrote in 1941 that Hitler's war against the Jews had triggered a unanimous Jewish response, and now I'm quoting from Hillel Silver, to the hilt and to the finish, Men whose hands are on machine guns, or hurling hand grenades, or driving tanks, or piloting bombers, who give blow for blow. They are united against Hitler as is no other people, for there is not a single Jew fighting in the Axis armies. Okay, we know that's not precisely true. There were Finnish and Soviet Jews who allied with Hitler against the Soviets. The Iraqi Jews were conscripted into Rashid Ali's army during the brief war against England. But... And again, I mentioned this at the beginning, and I can't emphasize it enough. I have found literary references from 1848 and beyond that emphasize over and over again the dilemma of Jews going into battle and possibly facing other Jews. It becomes particularly acute during the Franco-Prussian War, and even more so during World War I, on, mainly on the Eastern Front, but somewhat on the Western Front. This disappears. This discourse simply disappears. Now, Palestine's Jews receive the lion's share of praise for Abba Hillel Silver. As he writes somewhat inaccurately, almost from the first day of the war, the entire yeshuv mobilized as one man. There was an article that ran, they work and fight. According to one article, the yeshuv's rates of volunteerism were among the highest in the world. Uh, now, this is not quite true. We have the experts here who know that the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, or before the Nazi invasion, there had actually been quite a bit of opposition, particularly among the pro-Soviet factions within the kibbutz movement to fighting for imperialist Britain. Uh, less <coughs> ideological souls simply resisted leaving behind farms, factories, and families. The venerable Jewish fears of the standing army as an agent of assimilation, hostile to Jewish observance, blended with the Zionist strategy of focusing, their, focusing military efforts on home to defend the Jewish national home. But, the fact is, we're talking about, again, a language, a way that an American Zionist could present Palestine to the American Jewish community. What's really interesting about this 1941 statement, it comes from a United Palestine Appeal yearbook that was published before Pearl Harbor. It was published in November. So it's really encouraging the war effort at a time when the United States is not yet in the war. At exactly the same time, the Jewish war veterans of the United States officially supported the American policy of non-intervention, but heaped praise upon Canadian Jews who were in the fight against Hitler. So 
They didn't want to actually explicitly call for America to join the war, but they were, sub rosa, very much supporting uh, Jews in the war effort. But again, they would claim that Canadian Jews were in the forefront of the war effort, and like the claims about Palestine, they were more than a bit exaggerated. Because until 1944, Canadian conscripts had to volunteer for overseas service, and Canada's Jews were less likely to do so than others. One in five Canadian Jews in uniform was a draftee who refused to be sent abroad, colloquially known as zombies. Uh, a, a community of recent immigrants from Eastern Europe, Canadian Jews had little affection for the British Empire. So, again, we're talking about a representation of reality that is not entirely, entirely accurate. The spirit, then, of integration, of patriotism, of Jewish particularity, and of a Zionist uh, goal all came together during the war in the activities of a cluster of Zionist activists who combined propaganda, fundraising, and political lobbying into a massive consciousness-raising campaign among the American public on behalf of a future Jewish state. Most of this activity was the work of revisionists, in particular a delegation of Palestinian Jews led by the nephew of Abraham Isaac Cook under the pseudonym of Peter Bergson. The Bergson group worked alongside of and also against the revisionist New Zionist organization, itself led by emigres like Ben Sion Netanyahu, a name probably more familiar to people in this country than in Canada. Support for these relative newcomers came from established second and third generation American Jews who had not been lured by the siren call of socialism and who would have assimilated into a comfortable American bourgeois identity had it not been for Hitler. Now, there were several national armies in exile during the war, and the idea of a Jewish army fighting both against Hitler and for Palestine was particularly appealing to Irish Americans who were anti-British and to liberal Protestants like Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Tillich. The Bergson group was particularly effective at winning endorsements from national political leaders, such as congressmen, senators, and governors. Now, I'm not arguing, I certainly wouldn't argue sitting here in Tel Aviv, that the revisionists in the United States created a Jewish army, because that's just not true. Um, the Jewish army, I think it had something to do with Weizmann, I, I, I would imagine. That's, I'm using British understatement. No doubt about it. Yeah, a bit, a bit of British, British understatement. No, obviously it's the creation of combined efforts by Frank Weizmann and Jean-Luc <coughs> Goyon. There's a long political uh, story to the establishment of the Jewish Brigade that you are all familiar with. The point I'm making... No. Okay. I will show it. There you go. I rest my case. The point is that the idea of the Jewish army had considerable appeal among American Jews and non-Jews alike, and it tells us much about the nature of Jewish sensibilities in the United States in the midst of the war. It was in the United States where American Jews could feel comfortable enough with their identity as Americans and as Jews that Bergson could take out advertisements in major newspapers calling attention to the growing Holocaust, that term being used in the December 1942 issue of the New Zionist Organization of America's Oregon Zion News. He enlisted some of Hollywood's and Broadway's biggest names to create and mount a theatrical pageant celebrating the Jewish contribution to civilization and calling for a Jewish army. This pageant was called We Will Never Die, and it was seen by over 100,000 people in New York City, Washington, Boston, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And he enlisted people. It was Danny Kaye, uh, Marlon Brando was cast in one of these pageants. He plays a Holocaust survivor named David, who's on the verge of suicide and despair, and then he goes off to fight in Palestine. So we have a level of, of a comfort level for American Jews during the war, uh, I can't imagine, for example, the Jews of London during World War II staging a pageant uh, like we will, never, we will Never Die. And I believe that to some extent, and it's hard to know because I'm going to say, talk a little bit now about the experience of Jewish soldiers themselves while all of this um, patriotic language is being produced at home. I said earlier that there were encounters between American Jews and non-Jews that could be unfriendly and anti-Semitic but also integrative. We have a huge problem with sources. That is, it's one thing to read newspapers, rabbinical sermons, accounts by activists, and we can figure out more or less what they did and what they thought. 
But we're going to try to find out what soldiers in the field thought, and this is a methodological issue for the conference as a whole. Uh, you know, we can look at letters home, but there's a whole problem with letters home. First of all, whether they survive or not is hit and miss. Second, and I've, I've got to admit I spent a lot more time reading letters from World War I than from World War II for my own research. Uh, people tend to adopt a certain style of writing when they write letters home during the war. They don't really want to tell their families everything that's happening. They don't want to, or they can't. Mm -hmm. So there's censorship, there's self-censorship, there's trauma. Now there are exceptions, and I've had a bit of an argument with some scholars about this, because every now and then you find a letter that goes into great gory detail about some horrific military action or you find a letter where somebody says, God, I love killing, that sort of thing. But that is definitely the exception, and not the rule. Well, then there's memoir literature. Well, we're all familiar with the problems of memoir literature. We're gonna talk about sources later on in this conference. If a memoir is written after 1945, which by definition it will be, it's going to deal with the acknowledgement of the Shoah, and that's going to affect the way the war experience is interpreted. If it's written after 1948, it's going to be altered by the experience of the establishment of the State of Israel. Memoirs tend to be written when people are in their older years. The passage of time, memory plays tricks on all of us, but also historical experience simply alters the way we view the past. So it's very difficult to um, know for sure how people felt or what they felt, um, but I think there is enough evidence to suggest that um, from the you know, lack of draft dodging, the number of Jews who fought, the numbers who became officers, the numbers who were decorated, um, the extent we have primary source, whether it's memoir literature, interviews, which are also can be helpful, all of this does suggest a greater level of integration than, say, in previous wars. I should just mention something about interviews as a source. Um, you know, I've interviewed a lot of men about their military service in World War II, Korea, there are two things men like to brag about, and one of them is military service. And I tend not to trust men talking about either of these things. So, I mean, there is that problem also that people tend to, uh, men in particular, tend to exaggerate their importance in, in certain uh, aspects of life. This was, I believe that this level of, of, of comfort, of being truly American, while fighting the war against Hitler, against Tojo, it's seen very much as the war against Hitler, whether rightly or wrongly, was simply not appreciated, I think, by, say, the Jews from Palestine who were serving in the British forces abroad. Of course, there were those here as well. The newspaper Achayel Haivri, which was published briefly in 1943, has an article in its inaugural issue called Hala Shoah, in which it reads, in which it says, we cannot be satisfied that many Jews participate in various fronts. They take part in them as soldiers of various peoples. Their heroism and sacrifice are not recorded in the name of their people. Our brethren are slaughtered as Jews, as Jews. In Jewish units, we want to meet in battle. We will not agree to purchase the right to active participation in the campaign at the price of erasing our Jewish face and Hebrew name. Our infantry battalions carry in them this right in the essence of their being. But let me present some counter evidence, not from living Jews who survived, but from dead ones. Evidence that North American Jews could indeed be steeped in the notion that between 1939 and 45, they were in fact fighting as Americans, or now as Canadians, for a Jewish war. I refer to the tombstone of one George Meltz, killed at Juneau Beach, July 8, 1944, and buried in the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, Benny sur Mer Cemetery in Calvados, France. His tombstone reads, he died, so Jewry shall suffer no more. A few days earlier, rifleman Israel Friedman, born in Minsk and an immigrant to Winnipeg, Manitoba, had been killed in battle and buried in the same cemetery. In a letter of condolence to Friedman's widow, the company quartermaster, Sergeant R. Rosen, wrote, quote, Izzy, like other Jewish boys, had something more to fight for, a greater cause, and please console yourself with these few words. We over here are all ready to give our lives that others may live. 
it is a duty not only to king and country, but to the Jewish people the world over. So to conclude, for Jews and the Allied armies, the Second World War represented a pinnacle of integrative engagement, both discursive and concrete, with the armed forces of the modern state. The war effectively, though, constituted the final chapter of the story of Jews as a minority fighting within and for their countries of residence. World War II was the last global Jewish war. After 1945, diaspora Jews all but stopped fighting in wars. Yes, Jews fought in Korea and in Vietnam and in the Persian Gulf War. 269 died in Vietnam, 53 in the Persian Gulf. But Jews who have fought for the United States in those wars have been neglected by their own communities the world over. Before the Second World War, Jewish communities honored their dead regardless of provenance. Today, synagogues offer prayers for the safety of the soldiers of Israel and remember their fallen. But there are no prayers for the Jews who died in the Persian Gulf War or in Vietnam or in Korea, nor even for the 11,000 American Jews who died in World War II. Thus, the importance of this conference. Whereas Jews in and from the former Soviet Union have maintained the memory of their and their ancestors' service in the Great Patriotic War, in North America and in Israel, the story of Jewish soldiers in World War II has been neglected. I believe that two sets of historically contiguous events, the Holocaust and the establishment of the State of Israel on the one hand, and the 1967 Middle East War and the anti-Vietnam War movement on the other, blotted the Jewish soldier out of collective Jewish memory. Europe's betrayal of its Jews made a century and a half of patriotic Jewish military service appear futile and misguided. The Israeli fighter assumed the role formerly held by the diaspora Jewish soldier as the epitome of Jewish masculinity and valor. I can't help but think of a postcard that was very popular until postcards went out of fashion. Of the Israeli soldier service uh, weapons slung over his shoulder praying at the Western Wall. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the equivalent of that was a tapestry of German Jews in uniform and armed engaged in Yom Kippur prayers outside of Metz in 1871. The tapestry was very widely reproduced. It was a fictional, it never happened by the way. But it was a story of armed Jews praying. But they were praying for the Kaiser. Right Now it's the Israeli soldier, although we don't have postcards, we have websites. Israel's lightning victory over its Arab foes in 1967 accelerated the lionization of the Israeli soldier and the marginalization of his diaspora counterpart. In the United States of the 1960s and 70s, Jewish activists passionately opposed to the American involvement in Vietnam condemned the army and wanted nothing to do with it. From the 1970s onward, Jewish historical writing in North America steadfastly neglected Jewish soldiers, and meanwhile in Israel, scholars usually considered the diaspora Jewish soldier to be too inconsequential for serious attention. The Jewish soldier from the Second World War deserves to be rescued from oblivion and subject to serious historical study. His presence or absence throws new lights on the state's policies towards Jews, on Jewish attitudes towards state power and the use of force, and on many other aspects of what was the most costly and destructive war in human history. And as we heard very briefly last night, it is impossible to understand the origins of Israel's military, one of the hallmarks of the Jewish state, without probing the history of the relationship between Jews and military service during the war. The lines of connection between Jewish soldiers in World War II and those who fought for Israel's establishment in 1948 were often personal and direct. I hope that the coming two days will explore these and other issues related to the largest deployment of Jews in military operations in human history. Thank you. We have eight minutes to spare. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, very thoughtful uh, lecture. I'm sure it's a wonderful opening for this conference. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions because in five minutes from now we have to start the next session. So let's take five minutes and only five minutes and uh, we'll start again. Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much.